Welcome to the Psychology Podcast, where we give you insights into the mind, brain, behavior, and creativity. I'm Dr. Scott Barry Kaufman, and in each episode, I have a conversation with a guest who will stimulate your mind and give you a greater understanding of yourself, others, and the world we live in. Hopefully, we'll also provide a glimpse into human possibility. Thanks for listening and enjoy the podcast. Today, it's a pleasure to have Molly Crockett on the podcast. Dr. Crockett is an assistant professor of psychology at Yale University and a distinguished research fellow at the Oxford Center for Neuroethics. Prior to joining Yale, Dr. Crockett was a faculty member at the University of Oxford's Department of Experimental Psychology and a fellow of Jesus College. She holds a BSc in neuroscience from UCLA and a PhD in experimental psychology from the University of Cambridge, (laughs) woohoo, and completed a Wellcome Trust postdoctoral fellowship with economists and neuroscientists at the University of Zurich and University College London. Molly, I'm so excited to finally have you on the Psychology Podcast. It's so great to be here. Thank you so much for inviting me. Uh, Yes. You know, uh, we were just reminiscing about how we've known each other for quite some time. You know, we were were classmates together and I I have this mental image of the first time I met you. I think it was at King's College reception at Cambridge. Probably, yeah. And in like 2000 and I want to say like five, six, six. Six. It would be six. Yeah, 2006. And we both, um, like, I'm trying to remember the conversation, but I remember we were both, like, lost. Yeah, I mean, Cambridge is a pretty weird place to show up. I grew up in Southern California where none of the buildings are older than about 50 years old. Yeah. And to, to show up at King's College is pretty amazing. I think we yes. discovered pretty quickly we were both psychologists, and that was a, a yes. point of... It's been such a delight for me to watch your career soar. Yeah, it's just so cool. Anyway. Oh, thank you. That's very kind. I wanted to talk a little bit about how your research has changed over the years and how you got into the research you're doing now. Because if I recall correctly, at Cambridge, you were doing really groundbreaking work on the brain and uh, implications for like for medicine, I believe, and like neurochemistry interventions and things of that nature. Yeah. So my research has changed quite a lot over the years. I guess when I showed up at at Cambridge in 2006, I I went there to work with Trevor Robbins and Luke Clark on how serotonin influences cognition and behavior. And at the very beginning of that work, I was primarily interested in self-control and impulsivity. And it was sort of through a series of happy accidents that I ended up working on morality. And initially was working on serotonin and morality, how serotonin affects our moral judgments, our decisions about like how to respond to unfairness, for example. But eventually my interests broadened out beyond the neurochemical aspects of morality. And now in my lab, we're doing a a wide range of uh, approaches to questions that broadly concern social behavior and, and, and moral judgment. And we use methods from brain imaging and still a bit of pharmacology to behavioral experiments and now most recently looking at very large data sets of behavior on social media. That's with a postdoc in my lab, Billy Brady. So it's really exciting for me to be able to always be learning new approaches to understanding something so complex as human morality because I really do think you need to kind of throw the kitchen sink at it. It's it's one of those age-old questions that really benefits from approaches that are not just multidisciplinary, but also using lots of different methods. And, and I feel incredibly lucky to be able to do my job. It's really fun. Yeah, I love that you bring all these different perspectives to studying a really and really important topic that's like the topic, some could argue, is like the topic of, of our age. It's just amazing to see how things have changed. I mean, since we way. first met, since that 2006. Like, I don't feel like it, none of this stuff was in my head at the yeah. time, like as as on my radar as even an important research topic. Totally. Like, you know, here I was in my little silo at Cambridge, like studying intelligence. But times have changed and, and, and my research interests have also changed dramatically since then as well. I mean, it's just so interesting. It's like, here we are, like 2019. Mm-hmm. That's true. I was, I was not on Twitter in 2006. Did- So when did Twitter start? It started around then, I think. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I think I I, I didn't get on Twitter until 2011. Yeah, I I think 
same for me or maybe 2012 for me. I don't think it's made me happier as a person. (laughs) Would you agree with that experience? Uh, You know, it's these kinds of things are hard to self-assess. I mean, on the one hand, I clearly gained some value from it because I spend a lot of time on social media, but there are different kinds of, of values there. What philosophers like to st- distinguish between first order desires and second order desires. So there are your, your first order immediate desires, like I want to log into Twitter and check my latest number of likes and followers. And then there's your second order desire about whether you want to have yeah. that initial desire. And I think I, I find myself increasingly in moments where my first order desires with respect to technology use are not in line with my second order desires. Well, that conflict arises in lots of different situations, you know, and so that's an important Indeed. topic of investigation Indeed. in itself. Like when they like kind of like system one and system two are aligned and when they are really, really divergent from each other or conflict. Well, mm-hmm. what, should we just jump into Indeed. your research on moral outrage? Sure. Should we just do it? You wrote this terrific paper on moral outrage in the digital age. One finding from that um, really stuck out at me. You said, I found it so interesting that you found that immoral acts encountered online tend to cite stronger moral outrage than immoral acts encountered in person or via traditional forms of media. And I feel like there's so many implications of that for morality, you know, for a lot of things. I was just wondering, like, how you interpret that finding in the sense of, like, do you think people are more likely to, like, signal things online that they don't actually really genuinely, authentically believe, but they kind of get caught up in this peer pressure to signal things? Well, I think that that's a separate question that is maybe loosely related to the first question about the strength of emotional reactions to material encountered online versus offline. And I think one important limitation of the data that I've looked at to note is that uh, the data comes from an experience sampling study that was led by Will Hoffman and colleagues and published in 2014. And they they had participants in this study um, responding multiple times a day to uh, randomly timed uh, text messages that sent them a link to a survey that asked them whether in the past hour they had witnessed, been the target of learned about or committed any moral or immoral acts. And then if the answer was yes, they asked various follow-up questions, including like, how angry do you feel about this incident? How disgusted and so on. Um, So I was able to analyze these moral outrage responses, a mixture of anger and disgust really, to immoral events people learned about depending on where they had learned about that. But the analysis doesn't distinguish between different types of content. So we don't know from this data whether the thing that people are outraged about online is the same thing that they are outraged about, that they read about in the news. And I think what's driving those differences, even though I can't be sure because the data doesn't go down to the, that level of detail, but most likely the what's driving the differences in the emotional response is that people are probably more likely to see really, really outrage provoking content online mm. compared to other forms of media because that content is getting selected for mm. by newsfeed algorithms that prioritize content that's most likely to draw user engagement. And there's quite a lot of research now, I mean, some research um, initially looking at virality by Jonah Berger and Katie Mil- Milkman, yeah. who you might have... Um, connected with at at Penn, showing that like emotional content is more likely to go viral. And then more recently, Billy Brady and colleagues at NYU have shown that specifically moral emotions are especially, especially likely to go viral. And of course, outrage is a moral emotion. And so it stands to reason that the reason why in that data set, we see stronger outrage responses to immoral acts learned about online than offline is probably because that content is getting selected for for its virality or, or or potential to go viral. So do these things like operate by similar like cultural evolution principles or like mimetic transmission principles? Yeah, potentially. I mean I, I think it's a nice analogy to think of the selection of content on social media by newsfeed algorithms as operating according to some sort of evolutionary principle where fitness is 
is is measured by engagement social reward you know like yes mm -hmm. tribal i mean that's one of the most deep-seated right, evolutionary instincts is the need for belonging right yeah and that's a theoretical piece that has a little bit of data on it and yes. now in my lab there's a whole team that's being led by billy brady a postdoc in my lab oh. to test some of the questions that I outline in that piece with actual data. So that's been super exciting. I'm learning all about machine learning alg <laughs> algorithms so cool. and how to train classifiers. And it's it's been a, a, a wonderful educational journey. But yeah, the initial piece was was really a reaction to recognizing that I was spending way more time on social media than I really intended to. And that a lot of my choices to share certain kinds of content were feeling really non-intentional. And of course, my background from the, the Cambridge days, working with Trevor Robbins, sure. who along with Barry Everett developed really foundational work on drug addiction yeah. and how um, drug addiction, uh, you know, in some cases can be modeled as a shift from goal-directed behavior to habit-based behavior. You know, I was sort of steeped in those ideas as a graduate student in Cambridge and started to think about my own behavior on social media as potentially uh, transitioning from goal-directed to habitual. And of course, one of the seminal findings that's that's come out of work on goals and habits by Tony Dickinson, oh. also Cambridge. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, yeah, Tony Dickinson and I, I believe Dickinson and Shanks in the 80s published this paper on different schedules of reward. And they showed that variable interval reinforcement is sort of random, unpredictable delivery of rewards is the best, well, or you know, the most effective way to establish a habit. And that's, of course, exactly how social rewards are de delivered to us on social media, right? Yeah. You don't know when your post is going to get liked. You don't know how many likes it's going to get. And so we post something and then we're like refreshing the page like a rat pressing a lever for cocaine. Yes. And, you know, these are very, very basic principles of reinforcement learning and, and engineers, Facebook and Twitter know this and have designed their systems to um, maximize the, the amount of time we spend on the platforms. And, and, you know, and there's all sorts of value judgments one can make about whether that's morally right or morally wrong. You know, I see my role as a scientist to really describe what's happening and to gather data about the effect of different kinds of technology design on behavior. You know, there is a lot of potential for moral panic around these issues. And there's quite a lot of opinions about what social media is doing to our mental health, our social relationships, democracy, etc. Right. But like, you know, for every thousand opinions, there's maybe one data point, right? So like the amount of actual data relative to the number of opinions out there is, in my view, problematically small. And so what we're doing in my lab is trying to actually apply psychological theory to test some ideas and see whether we can find uh, empirical evidence for them. That's great. Uh, relating to the uh, addiction point that you made, reinforcement learning, there's one, I, I want to pull out one of your juicy, you have a lot of juicy quotes in that paper. Mm. This one, I tweeted this today. Did you see I tweeted all this stuff from you today? <laughs> so I got like, so excited. Okay. Just as habitual snacker, just as a habitual snacker eats without feeling hungry, a habitual online shamer might express outrage without actually feeling outraged. So if we apply those same principles to like the addiction of of anything, like cocaine, for instance, you know, we know that with the dopamine, with the difference between wanting and liking, you know, systems mm -hmm. of dopamine, you can actually not enjoy doing it at all, but you kind of right. sort of feel compelled. Right. So um, there are two it, right? really important things I want to emphasize here. The first is that uh, the hypothesis about habits that I lay out in that paper is a hypothesis. We don't actually have data to support this yet, although, of course, it feels very intuitive that a lot of yeah, behavior I on social... it already. <laughs> no, it's fine. No, I think yeah. it is a hypothesis yeah. that we're testing. And um, I, I think hopefully in the next couple of months, we'll have some some empirical cool. support that's consistent with this. But but it, yeah, I, I want to make sure that listeners flag this as like, like an idea that's not been established yet. Um, the second thing that I think is really important to distinguish, especially in the context of social media and all the opinions out there, 
is that there's an important distinction between habitual behavior and addiction. And addiction, of course, you know, you may know more about it than me. I'm not a, a scholar of addiction, but I, I, I have close colleagues who are. And like, it's really important to emphasize that an addiction has a very specific definition, both in terms of its neurobiology and its behavioral consequences. And I mean, one really important hallmark of an addiction is, is that it, there's persistent uh, you know, continuation of the behavior despite negative consequences. And, and I, I think probably a lot of people using social media might wish they use it less and might feel like they are automatically or impulsively logging in, but I'm not sure that they would go so far to say as that the consequences for them are negative and therefore it wouldn't meet yeah. the, you know, the, the strict definition for an addiction. So, you know, there are tons of options out there like, oh, you're addicted to Facebook, you're addicted to Twitter. Yeah. You know, one of my favorite ones is um, Twitter is, what, what did somebody write? Uh, Twitter is the crystal meth of newsrooms. That was an opinion piece in the Washington Post that came out after the Covington Catholic controversy had kind of entered phase two after the initial out outrage over the video that went viral showing kids in MAGA hats shouting at a Native American man. As more footage came out, it became clear that the situation was more complicated than it initially had been presented. And several journalists sort of walked back their initial opinions or, and, and deleted tweets that they had written. And there was a, a sort of very, uh, very temporary moment of reckoning, I think, amongst many journalists about Twitter and what kinds of behaviors it incentivizes, right? But like, you know, is Twitter the crystal meth of newsrooms? Like, that's probably an overstatement based on what we know about the science of addiction. And I personally would love to see more input from scientists who actually study addiction, because, you know, it's not helpful for actual addiction research to have the lines being very blurred in terms of what counts as an addiction and what what doesn't. Thank you, Molly. That that was really terrific and important nuance. So thank you for saying all that. You know, similar debates are raging with in terms of sex addiction. Is is that and a lot of people right. don't think that it, it could it exists. Mm -hmm. You know, and so maybe the most like reasonable thing to say right now is like there are lots of things in this world that give us quote a dopamine hit. You right. know, and just because we have these deep seated like like social rewards, for instance, is mm -hmm. evolved to probably be totally. one of the most rewarding mm -hmm. things in that dopamine system. Um, but that Absolutely. doesn't mean that every time we get a dopamine hit from something, we're addicted to that thing. So right. maybe exactly. that's just the most reasonable thing. Yeah. Yeah. So let's talk about outrage fatigue. Did you coin that? Because <laughs> that was, oh, okay, no, 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 I no. used that phrase in no, your article. No, definitely okay. not. No, other, no, others have talked about that. I mean, that's another thing that, that I, I think there's not really good data one way or the other. And if you look at the larger social psych literature on anger expression and aggression, like there's actually evidence that would support the existence of a phenomenon like outrage fatigue, you know, basic processes like, you know, uh, desensitization and habituation. At the same time, there is some evidence from, from studies of aggression that there's a sensitization process as well in the sense that, like, you know, ex, you know venting anger makes you more likely to, ex, you know, to aggress in the future because you're sort of ruminating about it and you're, you're, you're not letting it go. So I think that the broader question of whether outrage fatigue is happening en masse is, again, like, from what we know from psychological research it's a mixed bag and there's just not data on this. But it's an intriguing idea, isn't it? I mean, it's similar to, um, you know, there's Certainly, this idea yeah, called yeah. like compassion fatigue as well, you know, like, and that has been studied a little bit right. by like Adam Grant and right. Reb Rebele wrote a really cool article in Harvard mm -hmm. Business Review about that. So maybe yeah, yeah, yeah. there are similar principles at play yeah. there. Yeah. Certainly. Yeah. And I mean, it's, it's interesting to think about like, if that phenomenon does exist, if, if it's a real thing, then, then, should we be thinking about like, yeah. I don't know, rationing our outrage, <laughs> like reserving it for issues that, that we personally find most important, but then how do you even define that given that our moral judgments are so context sensitive and, and sensitive to factors that are even unrelated mm -hmm. to the, the topic at hand. So I know it just seems very fraught to, to, to think about how, how we might, try to regulate our own outrage in a 
in a principled way. I'm not saying that we should or shouldn't try to do that, but I, I'm, I'm like deeply respectful of like yeah. how thorny and complicated a yeah. project that would be, right? Like, you know, if, if we, you know, let's say for the sake of argument, let's say that outrage fatigue exists and like we discover that, you know, for the average human, like, you know, expressing outrage, you know, you, you can, you can express outrage and, and, and feel it, you know, for real, like, yeah. I don't know, twice a day just to pick a totally fictional random number. Right. Well then like when the first time we encounter something outrageous occurs, what do we do with that? Like, what if there's something worse that's coming? Oh, wow. Do we not want to waste our outrage bank. on piggy bank the, about the first thing? You see, yeah, but I mean, it's it feels preposterous yeah. to try and think about emotions in that way, right? Like emotions evolve to serve very specific functions and like to try and impose some sort of, you know, goal-directed, intentional means of their, you know, of experiencing them is is a huge project. Although I guess, as I'm saying those words, this is in some sense a project of uh, mindfulness, right? Like in you know in in mindfulness practice, and I know that you've you've had people on the show who are way more expert than me on on this, and and you've written about it yourself. But like one aspect of mindfulness practice is finding a way to not act on every emotion that we experience and to allow them to rise and fall and without judgment observe that happening without getting caught up in them, right? To cultivate a sense of equanimity with what's happening outside of us and inside of us. So yeah, um, it's possible. maybe <laughs> uh, someone should do a study, a mindfulness intervention for outrage fatigue. Like someone should do that study. <laughs> It would be really interesting. Yeah, I had 147 things I wanted to respond to about that. Hold on. Let me, let me pick one uh, in the moment. Uh, <laughs> this is a tough thing about doing this podcast in the moment. It's some of what you're saying seems analogous to the ego depletion research. You know, maybe there's like a, not an ego depletion, you know, the self-control mm. of Baumeister research, all that. But maybe there's like a compassion, which, which goes into the, their costs and benefits of outrage fatigue, or, of, of outrage, not fatigue, but just a showing outrage. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I, I think that's something that's, that's really important to highlight, you know, right. out, outrage gets a lot of negative press, especially these days. And my own uh, article that you read has been interpreted by some people as making an argument that outrage is bad. I don't know if that was your impression, but I want to no, make it wasn't. very clear that I am not, right. I am not making any value judgments about whether outrage is a good thing or a bad thing. It's an emotion. It's complicated. It, ha it can have good consequences. It motivates collective action. Uh, Victoria Spring, Daryl Cameron, and Mina Chikara wrote a really nice paper in Ticks highlighting some of the upsides of outrage. That's what the paper's mm -hmm. called, the upside of outrage. Um, but there are, of course, also downsides, many of which, you know, are, are being talked about now in terms of potentially uh, exacerbating social conflicts and and um, political polarization and whatnot, oversimplifying issues and, and you know, turning complex characters into all good or all bad. Like these are consequences of outrage too. And having studied extensively the um, psychological processes and neurobiological processes of decisions to punish other people for perceived violations of social norms like fairness. So, you know, work on you know, ultimatum game, for example, that was my, that was what my dissertation was on mm -hmm. at Cambridge and, and how, um, how people decide whether to accept being treated unfairly or to engage in costly punishment. So paying some money to themselves to destroy the, the pie of someone who's been really selfish. Right. And, one thing that I found um, in my postdoctoral research is that if you put people in situations where they can punish unfairness on behalf of either themselves or on behalf of a, another person, people reliably do this. And if you ask them afterwards, why? Why did you punish? And you get them to rate their agreement with various statements like, I punished because I really cared about fairness and I wanted to teach them a lesson. Or I punished because it just felt really satisfying and I wanted to get revenge. And you can ask many statements like this and you can then group the statements into more sort of socially minded and deterrence focused motives. So I want to teach this person a lesson so they're not going to do it again in the future. 
and retributive motives. Like, I just wanted to screw that person, right? And what we find is that people are unwilling to endorse having punished out of revenge. Like, we don't see high agreement with those items. But people are very willing to say that they punished because they care about fairness. They wanted to teach a lesson. These, like, you know, good outcomes of punishment, Is that social right? desirability um, responding? Sure. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think this is capturing social desirability. But the the way we design the experiment, we can actually infer from their behavioral responses how much they cared about these different motives because half the time when they're punishing, the person who gets punished never finds out. So there's no way they can teach a lesson through that secret punishment because the person never finds out they've been punished. So that kind of punishment can only be be explained by pure retribution motives, right? So we have in this experiment measurement of the actual motives that we can infer from behavior and then people's self-reports of their motives. And what we find is they don't really match up that well. So ruh-roh, ruh-roh. <laughs> <laughs> Oh humans. Oh so humans. Deterrent punishment. So punishment that is actually communicative, that actually does teach a lesson to the recipient. That's correlated reasonably well with people's self-reports of I punish because I wanted to teach a lesson. But the retributive punishment is totally uncorrelated with self-reports of retributive motives. So what that suggests to me is that in the case of these punishment decisions, people to some extent are either unaware of or unwilling to report the sort of less socially desirable motives that drive a lot of punishment behavior. And I wonder, I know I have no evidence for, but I wonder how much of this is now at play on social media, where it's very, very easy to punish perceived violations of social norms. You can very easily, you know, write a tweet to shame someone, call them out for behavior that you think is bad. You can retweet or like other people's statements of that. And like, I'm not sure how much people are aware of what their motives are when they're engaging in this behavior. And, you know, these are just really interesting questions from a psychological perspective, but I I think they also have really important implications potentially for, for our democracy and our our social discourse more broadly, you know, so, and I I feel like I'm constantly kind of switching between uh, taking on and off different hats. There's the like Molly as scientist hat, which is like when I'm wearing the scientist hat, I care about using data to, to portray the world in the most accurate way that I can and trying as best I can to keep my own political beliefs and value judgments out of it. But then there's also like my citizen hat where I like started working on these issues because I felt really concerned about the direction that the country's going. And and I I wanted to use my training in a way to like maybe do whatever I can to help the situation. Um, But it's like complicated, you know, juggling those different identities. And I, I definitely have had missteps where like I have let my own values like you know creep into you know a talk or an interview where i you know i'm i'm talking about the science but then maybe it, the way that i present it is tinged with some of my values and i'm doing the best that i can like it's 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 hard though and it it, it feels in, increasingly complicated to do science on issues that are that are the topic of a lot of heated social discourse. And I, I'm sure I'm preaching to the choir to you, uh, having worked on intelligence, right? Like, it's hard to try and, and maintain an objective view of, of the scientific problem when there's this deafening chorus of people telling you how you should or should not think about the problem. And if you think about it in this way, then uh, not only are you wrong, but you're also a bad person. And like, and the stakes just feel so high, right? More so than ever before. You know, compared to 2006, like, so we're, you know, <laughs> yeah. you know, so and it's, it keeps things interesting. I will say that. It sure does. And stressful, <laughs> if we can be honest. 
No, I, I appreciate you being vulnerable enough to admit that. I um, admitted something similarly on Twitter um, uh, recently. These hats that we put on, and when we're in one mode of that hat, we can kind of be blind to the implications for, like, if we were in the other hat, you know, and then we're in the other hat and we think about all these implications and things. And then, yeah, so it does, you yeah. know, it, it's a lot easier to, like, just pick an identity <laughs> to pick one hat i guess is the because i am mm-hmm. trying to maybe like this conversation with with you right now it's helping me as well kind of formulate more directly what exactly the conflict is and maybe it's just like it's a lot mm-hmm. of there, there are people that seem to like be very comfortable just picking one hat and staying with it and, mm-hmm. and being part of that tribe is a great feeling of like certainty and like you know we can and i find it yeah i want to just like have this nuance to every single thing that comes in front of me yeah, I mean, you mentioned humility earlier, and I think I'm finding that as as a value increasingly helpful, um, especially as I'm starting in my research to touch more on issues to deal with race and gender. And I, I feel very intimidated by working on these issues because I know that I have yeah. so much to learn. And, you know, I, you know, there are many yeah. ways to be humble in, in the pursuit of scientific knowledge and particularly when asking questions around, yeah. you know, injustice and, and inequality, you know, like I, I just try to learn as much as I can. I, you know, I'm going to get stuff wrong sometimes. And, you know, the discomfort of being wrong is a, you know, is, is dwarfed by the discomfort of so many people who are in far less privileged positions than me. So I'm very happy to be uncomfortable if that can help me learn more and can help the broader systems of injustice and oppression that we are, you know, increasingly talking about as a society, both offline and online. I I love that so much, what you just said. I can't like it enough on social media. (laughs) You know, (laughs) as someone who's teaching a course at Columbia um, Barnard College about the science of living well, we can no longer just talk about the psychological aspects divorced from the context of people who don't even have the opportunities Mm -hmm. in the first place to exercise those psychological strengths, character strengths and things. So this is just Mm -hmm. constantly on my mind these days. Like like every day it's on my mind these days because I'm seeing things and, and my students are really teaching me a lot of things that I'm learning about, you know, like they're so intertwined that yeah, maybe this whole idea of you're really helping me in this conversation as well to think about this (laughs) more clearly. So thank you. Well thank you. Yeah, maybe like I'm glad to hear that. I need to not think about it as like different hats like i take this hat on and then off and then i put Mm -hmm. this on and off like maybe like we need to think of these things always always intertwined i'm just thinking like especially in the field i work in in positive psychology and the science of like how to live well i don't even know if we can ever if i can ever really have these different hats like i think they need to all the hats need to be on at the same time maybe is a better metaphor (laughs) Mm -hmm. so yeah anyway thank you so much for that just wanted to take this moment to thank you all for your support of the podcast over the years It's been a real privilege to do this podcast for you all for the past four years. It's been a real labor of love. If you'd like to further support the podcast, I wanted to let you know a few things you could do to help make it a better experience for you all. First, I'd really appreciate it if you could subscribe to the Psychology Podcast on iTunes. This would help make the show more prominent on iTunes and increase our listenership. I believe you can subscribe both on your iPhone and on your computer. Second, it'd be great if you could give the show a rating and review on iTunes. I definitely read all the reviews, and they're helpful to others who are thinking about giving the show a listen. Another thing you can do is donate something to the show. Even just the price of a cup of coffee would really help me continue to do this podcast for you all. To donate something, you can go to thepsychologypodcast.com and click on the link at the bottom that says Become a Sponsor. So thanks again for your incredible support of the show over the years. You know, I do this show for you all because I truly love sharing my enthusiasm and love of the mind, brain, and creativity, and I really appreciate you joining me on this journey. Okay, now back to the show. Students are the best. They really are. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I, <laughs> yeah, I, I <laughs> it's been really wonderful just having their questions and feedback as I've been presenting. You know, I, I, I teach a social neuroscience class and I just did the lectures on, on punishment and outrage last week. And it's you know, always such a, an informative mm. exercise to present 
the work to fresh minds and they're they're living this you know and one thing that i wonder a lot about and and i'm curious your your perspective on this because i know you've you've looked a lot at development and and adjustment and mm-hmm. and, and kids as they're you know learning who they are and and how to navigate through the world you know i really wonder what technologies like social media might be doing to the way young people construe the social world, right? Like when you think about our moral emotions and instincts that evolved in a very different environment than the one we now find ourselves in, and in particular, moral emotions and moral behaviors are exquisitely tuned to concerns about reputation, right? Because reputation is everything. It's, you know, Everything. At least it was in our ancestry in small tribes. Well, hard to gain and easy to lose, right? And like, how does it change the way you conduct yourself if you live in a world where it's on display? Anything you say or do, any yeah. any casual comments is preserved forever on the internet and could go viral at any time. It's preserved, oh it's preserved there. Is that true? You know, you know, not everything, of course, we're not like in full surveillance mode yet, but like anything you, you say publicly online can be preserved and could go viral and could be there for your future employees or your future dates uh, to see and evaluate. And grandchildren. I remember being a teenager and like you say stupid stuff when you're a teenager, right? Like that, like, part of becoming an adult and part of becoming, a, you know, a person who's more sensitive to others around them is screwing up and having people, you know, gently <laughs> call you out on it and, and you learn, right? And are technologies like social media fundamentally changing the process of moral learning in young people? Yeah. Huge question. I don't even know how yeah. to begin answering that question, but I think it's an important question. Well, you know, but, it, but the po- people on different political ends are going to be divided on that question. So some people are going to see it as a, a good thing. Some people are going to say that it um, it's causing teenagers to grow up to be so hypersensitive to every minor thing that, like, you know, could be perceived as immoral that we, like, have this authoritarian society. You, you can see there's, like, these different views in the political spectrum. I think there's a lot of projection on onto high you know again like I feel like a broken record sometimes but like I mean that's why it's so important that we actually do research on this so we can get a, get a grip on like you know maybe it actually has no effect like you know there was a paper that came out in Nature and Human Behavior a few weeks ago um, Amy Orban and some colleagues at Oxford did a, a multiverse analysis where they basically took these large data sets and then analyzed the data in every possible way it could be analyzed. And the research question was, broadly speaking, I'm probably getting the details wrong, but like, is social media use or internet use harmful for well-being, particularly in young people? And like, some studies say that it's harmful and others Mm -hmm. say that it's not harmful. And like, the data are very murky, partially because like, the way that the questions are asked are really high level. They're not getting deep into the psychological processes. Yeah. So like if the dependent variable, if, if what you're, if, um, or no, if, well, both actually independent and dependent variable, right? So like well-being is such a complicated construct, as you know, because you're teaching a class on it. And then also internet use is very complicated, like spending time online. Like you can't use a, a basic predictor, like how many hours a day do you use the internet? Like somebody who's spending all of that time going down YouTube rabbit holes about, you know, flat earth and, you know, violent conspiracy theories is going to have a very different impact of that time on well-being than someone who's like, you you know, using Facebook to message with their best friend oh, who yeah. moved away. Well, my colleagues at Penn at the World Wellbeing Project found that the language used on Twitter was a better predictor of uh, county-wide heart disease than every single other measure of heart Mm -hmm. disease combined. Like, that's usually looked at by, like, the WHO or something like that. Wow. So, you know, that's just one example Mm -hmm. of how even, like, constantly ruminating and, and using certain, like, negative, aggressive language on Twitter 
let's talk about uh, some goodness among humans. Because <laughs> you, you found this paper, yes. and, and tell me if my conclusion of this paper is wrong, but you found that, yes, it is true that we very quickly form moral impressions of people as either good or bad, but there's a certain flexibility that humans have as well mm-hmm. that build in, that show, illustrate the human capacity for forgiveness. Yeah. So um, this is research that was led by my PhD student, Jennifer Siegel. And um, we were interested in understanding at a very mechanistic level how people develop beliefs about the moral character of other agents. And so we ran a series of experiments where the, the basic task is to observe other people making decisions that can benefit themselves but harm someone else. And your job as an observer is to try and predict whether this other person is going to go for the selfish, harmful option or whether they will sacrifice their own interests to benefit the other person. And we compare how people form these beliefs about character for others who are relatively selfish versus others who are relatively altruistic. And what we find is that for both the good guys and the bad guys, people form pretty accurate beliefs about how good or bad those other people are. But the beliefs about the bad characters are much more uncertain and much more flexibly updated if you get new information than the beliefs about the good. Well, that's good and bad in that finding. <laughs> well, yeah. So so if you get if you get information that that somebody's pretty good, then you kind of park that belief and you're like, okay, cool. Cool. I don't have to worry about this person. I have this relatively stable belief that they're good, and and learning rates from new information are are pretty slow. So so once someone has an impression that someone's good, then they're pretty stable in that. And I think that comports with our own experience. Like our friends, like you know, we know they're good people, and we're you know, even if they right. occasionally let us down, like you know, for the most part, we have this stable good impression of them. When we get information that somebody might be bad, then this seems to transport the belief into this like volatile and uncertain state where it's much more quickly updated. And that could be in the good direction or the bad direction. And I think it's adaptive either way. So like you get some information that somebody like might be a jerk. And now you're like, okay, what do I do with this person? Well, first of all, you you probably spend a lot more Mm. of your attention thinking about this person. Like Mm. they're occupying more of your headspace, so to speak. And I think we can all think of examples of people in our lives who are like, eh, I don't know about this person. I don't know if they're trustworthy. And we're really, really sensitive to any new information we might get about people like this. If we get information that, you know what, actually... um, that thing that they did that made you question their motives, like maybe it was an accident or, you know, it's not as bad as you thought. And so you're like, whew, okay, cool. Now that I have this, this new information that they're actually reasonably trustworthy, then, then the belief can recover. Right. So we're, you know, we're not stuck with bad beliefs we have about people, but at the same time, if it turns out that person is even worse than we thought, then we're also able to adjust our belief in the downward direction as well. And broadly, I think that it's it's adaptive to have a cognitive system that develops character beliefs in this way because like what do you do with potentially untrustworthy people? Don't let them your how car. to make a good decision about that <laughs> relationship. Well, <laughs> probably, but you know, we live in a world where good people can make mistakes. Yeah. And if we were to write somebody off at the first sign of trouble, we would be overcorrecting and we would miss out on a potentially long relationship of mutual benefit with that person. And so, especially in an environment where most people are trust- trustworthy and cooperative when that's what the prevailing norms are and that's what seems to be like innate stance that, that humans have is, you know, generally cooperative and trustworthy and um you know there's a lot of psychological research on this like having that bias to leave room for movement in your bad beliefs uh, is is one that should be adaptive absolutely and this study that you uh, conducted with your colleagues focused on minor offenses so alexander todorov yeah that's asked true. the question you know what if the transgressions yeah. are major he said quote what if you were a participant in the quote 
bad agent was inflicting physical pain on you or somebody you love to maximize their earnings rather than on a stranger. And so it does make me think that mm-hmm. there might be a, a, just a hypothesis. You know, we I think we do view the R. Kelly's mm-hmm. of the world differently, you know, like For the Bill sure. Cosby's, yeah. you know, all that, you know, um, yeah. right? Yeah. We're not going to forgive Bill Cosby that easily. That's something I definitely should have mentioned at the beginning, which is that the kinds of selfish versus altruistic behaviors that we were studying in these experiments were very minor in the sense that like, these are the kinds of like most of the most of the behaviors that we form impressions of others on day to day are things like somebody didn't return our call or somebody was late to meet us, right? Like not this person is an ax murderer, but surprisingly a lot of the literature on impression formation and social psychology asks how people form impressions of others based on information. Like this person was an ax murderer. Oh, wow. That, yeah. was, that example was used. Well, no, I, I, I'm perhaps being hyperbolic. I definitely know like, uh, like gotcha. sold drugs to high school students. That's like a, that's definitely a stimulus that I've seen in a study that I've read for, uh, gotcha. yeah, various acts of theft. A lot of the, of the impression and formation research is based on extreme yeah. good and bad acts. Not all of it, not the whole literature, but quite a lot of it. And, and that's really interesting given that like, you know, most of us are not encountering those types of behaviors in our daily lives. And so we deliberately wanted to look at impression formation from these more minor transgressions with the caveat, of course, that like these learning processes are very likely to be different, if not in kind, then at least in degree uh, for more extreme transgressions. Thank you. So let's wrap up this conversation with a Twitter lightning round. Oh, God. Okay. So I asked on Twitter, you know, p- people to ask you questions. So I'm going to just, and you can be very succinct and quick in your answer. Sure. So Wara Meltem Bilkman said, what are the patterns or biomarkers in the physical brain which are associated with altruism? Oh, great question. And I was just lecturing about this to my class. So uh, there are a number of brain systems that have been implicated in altruism. One of them is empathy. And of course, um, this dates back to psychological work by Dan Batson and others, uh, highlighting the link between empathy and altruism. Um, Empathic responses in the brain, particularly in networks involved in experience sharing, like the anterior insula and anterior cingulate cortex, have been linked with altruistic behavior the mentalizing network as well. So the ability to take perspectives of others, including the the temporal parietal junction has been linked to altruism and the septal area as well, which is, is very deep within the brain. That area has been shown to respond to different kinds of empathy and also predict helping behaviors uh, as reported through daily diaries. And um, this is a really nice study by Sylvia Morelli and colleagues. There's also evidence that the reward system of the brain responds not just to our own rewards, but also to seeing others get rewards. So to the extent that we vicariously share the reward experiences of others, this is also predictive of altruism. There's, I, I could go on. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll wrap up. But like, there's actually, I have, a, I have a, like a, an hour and a half of lecture material on this very question. <laughs> So Brian Gallagher asks, do you see yourself as more sympathetic to any particular ethical school, for example, virtue ethics, utilitarianism, deontology? Oh, what a great question. That's tricky to answer. I think in part because the more I learn and read about different ethical perspectives, the more I feel like I don't know what my own is. I think I definitely lean consequentialist, but I wouldn't say that I'm uh, an extreme hardcore consequentialist. Um, we actually, uh, my my student, uh, former student, Jim Everett, and collaborator Guy Kahan, a philosopher at Oxford, led the development of a scale to measure utilitarianism and you can find out how utilitarian you are online i can give you, i can give you the nice. show notes yeah yeah um, so i'm i'm like slightly i'm 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 above average utilitarianism on that scale but not at the extreme so jeffrey miller asks how can effective altruism succeed as a movement if most people are morally disgusted by utilitarian reasoning <laughs> <laughs> Great question. I get that a lot. I actually, I, I've had several conversations with the effective altruism 
group. I was just uh, at a student dinner a couple of days ago um, chatting with them about this very question. So um, research that I've done with Jim Everett again and Dave Pizarro has suggested that people find utilitarian decision makers less trustworthy than deontological decision makers. And of course, effective altruism as a movement being quite utilitarian in nature is concerned about social perceptions given this research. One thing that we found in those studies is that if a utilitarian decision maker expresses that they felt conflicted about their utilitarian decision or you know they found it very difficult, then this erases the, the differences in trustworthiness. So I, I, what that suggests is that to the extent you can signal concern for others and you know other social emotions that are sometimes overridden in utilitarian choices, then that that can restore trustworthiness. Okay, but there still are, is an uphill battle if you're an effective altruist. Potentially, yeah. potentially, potentially an potentially, uphill battle. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Last last question. I saved the, I saved the best for last. Um, oh, and obviously, here. that's okay. my my subjective uh, valuing. But Brian Earp asks. How do you manage to be a brilliant scientist, a pro at managing a big multidisciplinary lab like Clockwork, and an extre- and be an extremely kind, caring, and motivating supervisor all in one person <laughs> and still somehow sleep? Oh, that's very, very kind. Over- overly kind. Um, I mean, I think to answer in one word, I guess it would be gratitude. Like, I, I just feel so grateful to be able to do this work and to be at a place like Yale that... I'm surrounded by so many smart and kind and motivated people. And, you know, my lab is amazing. And I I just feel really, really lucky and grateful to be able to play a role in in supervising those students. And and they make my work and my approach to science better. So, yeah, it's easy to do that, I think, when you take a step back and, and, and think about, like, Oh, like in 2006, when we met, like I could never have predicted that I would be, you know, where I am and doing this work. And you know, I'm I'm very grateful for that. Um, and I do sleep. I I I sleep. Um, try to sleep at eight hours, and that's enough. Your fans will be very happy to hear that. <laughs> that's a non-negotiable. I I I wish I had. You know, I've met many people. I won't I won't out them, but like I know scientists who can get by on like four hours, and I'm very jealous. I wish I needed less sleep because then I could do more of the stuff that I love doing. But for now, I have to get by on my eight hours. Well, thank you, Molly, for such a exciting, uh, nuanced, and thoughtful chat today. Thank you so much. Thanks for listening to the Psychology Podcast. I hope you enjoyed this episode. If you'd like to react in some way to something you heard, I encourage you to join in the discussion at thepsychologypodcast.com. That's thepsychologypodcast.com. Also, please add a rating and review of The Psychology Podcast on iTunes. Thanks for being such a great supporter of the podcast, and tune in next time for more on the mind, brain, behavior, and creativity.